Uh, welcome, everyone, to the fourth and final lecture in Noam Chomsky's lecture series here at UCLA. Uh, before uh, uh, Noam starts, I just wanted to make a couple of brief announcements. Uh, first, I wanted to acknowledge the support of the Dean of Humanities uh, and his discretionary fund to help support this visit. Um, I also want to acknowledge two graduate students at UCLA uh, whose idea it was to invite Noam to come and speak to us. And they actually made the initial move to invite him. Uh, one of them, I think, is here, Richard Stockwell, wherever you are. <laughs> uh, and uh, oh, there you are, right, OK. Uh, and Nikos Angelopoulos, who unfortunately had to go back to Greece to finish his dissertation. But uh, we'll be taping, uh, we're taping these, and he'll be here in spirit. Uh, finally, I thought I would just share a little piece of trivia that I learned today. And that is that Noam has a bee named after him. Do you know about this? Yeah. Uh, it's called, uh, let me get this, Mega Kylie Chomsky. <laughs> and it was discovered in Texas in 2013. So now you're all uh, in possession of the same trivia. Without further ado, please welcome Noam for his final lecture. I never did find out whether it's a honeybee with a waggle dance, but. I hope somebody will find that out for me. Well, uh, this has been pretty sketchy, especially yesterday. There's lots of uh, uh, loose ends that ought to be tied up. Uh, I hope, actually, I think it would be best maybe to uh, delay that to the uh, discussion period tomorrow. So I hope uh, you guys will come in with lots of uh, questions and objections, and we'll be able to see if we can fix up what wasn't done properly, of which there's a lot. Uh, there was actually one question that came up in the question period yesterday about an important uh, matter, and I didn't actually give the right answer to it. So let me uh, go through it here. If I can get this to work. This one? Others? Oh, yeah. The black red might show up a bit better. Okay. Right now, if not the black. Right. So the uh, paradigmatic example that I was giving about uh, what distinguishes the legitimate from the illegitimate ones, you can illustrate it with parallel merge, the thing that people tend to write like this, where you have uh, set A, B, C, this is the workspace, and then you adjoin this to this, and that's supposed to give you this thing, which in fact gives you uh, the set A, B, and the set B, C. And uh, this one becomes illegitimate because you can explode this to something as complex as you like. And since this is accessible, uh, you can move that to there. But then you have a chain connecting these two things, which can violate all conceivable uh, 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 properties that of the language. So that's illegitimate. Uh, the argument that it is illegitimate is it adds two instead of one accessible terms, namely this one here and this one here. And you're only allowed to add one in the minimal system of uh, resource control. So the question was, well, why doesn't this block uh, ordinary IM? So suppose you have uh, A, B, and you add <coughs> this guy over here. Uh, now you have B, A, B, ordinary internal merge, why can't you do the same thing, turn this into x, add this up here, and then you get the same problem. Uh, 
to think about it for a minute, which I <coughs> didn't when the question was asked. Well, this turns out to be a case of late merge. Uh, what you're doing is trying to pack this into something that you've already passed. And that doesn't work for the reasons I discussed last time. Uh, late merge, first of all, adds too many new accessible items. And then it also uh, requires an extra operation of substitution. So it's the worst case of illegitimacy. So that one's out. Uh, the difference is once you've intuitively, once you've passed a certain point in the derivation, you can't go back and do something to what you've passed. But that a problem doesn't arise in the parallel merge case because these two guys are separate and nothing is protecting the thing that you moved from. So that makes the right distinction. Well, there are a lot of other things that need to be clarified, but instead of that, I'd like to turn to something else and at least uh, touch on a few other things uh, briefly just to bring them up and won't be able to go into them in sufficient detail. Uh, one point is that uh, in addition to the symmetrical operation merge, uh, there's quite good, in fact, I think, completely compelling evidence that uh, we also need another operation, an asymmetric operation, in addition to merge. Uh, this is clear intuitively simply from uh, simple adjuncts. So, for example, if you have a phrase like uh, young man, uh, it's, uh, there's an asymmetry between the two that's clear. Uh, that element that's formed is a noun phrase, not an adjective phrase. So the old is an adjunct that's not changing the category. Notice this is quite different from symmetrical merge. In symmetrical merge, if you, have a, if you happen to have a head uh, and a, an XP, then the head will, in fact, be the label, the thing that traditionally projects. But that's just a case of minimal search. And that doesn't work for uh, uh, adjunct asymmetry. So if you have uh, old uh, portrait of John, portrait of John is not a head. It's complex, could be arbitrarily complex. But it's still the label of the, uh, of the whole unit. So there's a clear asymmetry. Uh, beyond that, there's a problem that's been lingering for uh, 60 years. It's the uh, serious problem. Uh, it's the problem of unbounded, unstructured coordination. And so if you have something like uh, uh, the guy is uh, young, uh, happy, uh, eager to go to college, you know, tired of wasting his time, uh, endless number of possible uh, adjuncts. There's no structure among them. They're strung together. They're unbounded. And that's a real problem. Uh, for one thing, you can't do it in any kind of phrase structure grammar uh, because you'd need an infinite number of rules. Uh, that's even true, interestingly, of, uh, un, un, uh, of the uh, universal case, unrestricted rewriting systems, uh, the ones that allow you to do anything, rewrite anything. You'd still need an infinite number of rules. Uh, notice that unrestricted rewriting systems, uh, as was proven by a great mathematician, Emil Post, long ago, are universal. Those are universal Turing machines, in effect, which means you can code the right result by some devious means but you don't get it by just rewriting the rules and looking at the structure. So that's out totally uh, from phrase structure grammar. About 60 years ago, uh, when George Miller and I were working on mathematical linguistics, we thought uh, we had an answer to this in terms of generalized transformations, but Howard Lasnik pointed out that that doesn't work either, uh, so there's no method around, no device around that allows this. However, it is allowed uh, immediately simply by the device of asymmetric pair merge. What we need is a new device. And uh, since we're trying to get the simplest possible operations, the simplest operation after set for ordinary simple set formation is just pair formation. 
So we need an operation pair merge, uh, which will also apply to the simple adjunct case like uh, young man. Uh, young will be adjoined to, will be attached to uh, man, but you don't see it in the labeling, okay, because it's often some other dimension. And the uh, unbounded, unstructured cases uh, show you, in effect, that there are uh, unboundedly many uh, dimensions to what's going on up there. It's not two-dimensional like a blackboard. Uh, you can add any number of adjuncts at any point. So we want uh, some device. We want to. We want to work this out. That means intuitively that uh, every member of uh, this coordinated construction, every individual member of it, is individually predicated of what it links to. Now we know that the order of the uh, unstructured, unbounded elements, this sequence, we know that the order of it matters. It matters because of reasons that were uh, pointed out by Jim McCauley about 40 years ago, namely notions like respectively. So if you say John and Bill saw Tom and Mary respectively, uh, the order in which they appear affects the semantic interpretation. So it's not just a set of paired things, it's a sequence of paired things. Uh, furthermore, the, um, more evidence that it's a sequence is that uh, adjuncts can repeat. So you can, can say uh, the guy is young, uh, tall, happy, young, uh, eager to go to Harvard, so on and so forth. You can repeat them as much as you want. So what we have is a situation where in order to generate these objects, you generate a set, a finite set. Uh, you pick out of, you form from that set a sequence, and it could be any sequence of elements, and there's, uh, in fact, infinitely many possible sequences. You pick one out of those, and that sequence, S, call it, is the thing that you're then going to merge into the construction to proceed with the interpretation. Uh, this operation of picking a particular element out of the set of sequences is uh, uh, the, the, the formal ways of doing it, which are familiar. Those of you who know some logical recognize that this is uh, uh, David Hilbert's uh, epsilon operator, which picks a single thing out of a set. It was part of his uh, work on foundations of mathematics, basic uh, operation. So it's a straightforward operation, but it does have the property that it's indeterminate. Okay, so it's, uh, that's part of the nature of production, as I discussed last time. Well, uh, what this means is, uh, uh, actually there's clearly two kinds of coordination conjunction and uh, disjunction. So what we're doing is forming uh, objects that look like this. We're forming a sequence which begins with some uh, uh, conjunction and then contains uh, a sequence of elements, each of which is predicated of something. So we have things, a sequence of things that look like this with a link. And in fact, we could say L1, Ln, uh, but in fact, all the links have to be identical. So one of the aspects of coordination is you're, uh, you're, you're, attach you're adjoining everything to the same point. Okay, so we can, and the same with all the ones here. So we have an object like that. That's the basic object that gives you uh, uh, unbounded uh, coordination when you get down to just one case, when n equals one, that's just plain a junction. So is the old young man and so on. Now, uh, uh, notice that uh, each element 
of these pairs is inaccessible. So if you have the phrase old man, say, you can't extract man and leave old, you can't extract old and leave man. So the elements of the pairs are inaccessible. And uh, if, that's, if that were all there was to it, notice that this would yield uh, both the coordinate structure and the adjunct island uh, constraint. You have the coordinate structure constraint because every term is inaccessible. You have the adjunct island uh, uh, constraint because you can't pull the things out. However, quite, it's not quite that simple, in fact, as the, I mentioned earlier a paper by uh, Joko Boscovich, which shows that there's, which just reviews uh, lots of different kind of complicated cases. There are languages in which you can extract uh, the ad, we, we, you can't extract the, uh, anything inside the adjunct. There are others where you can extract something that's inside but not the adjunct itself, and a couple of other cases. So there's more work to be done. And what it in fact shows is that this is, uh, that the concept of adjunct is just not sufficiently refined. There's a number of different kinds of adjuncts which behave quite differently. And uh, this is in fact a kind of a, uh, an unexplored uh, uh, dom uh, domain. It hasn't been looked at sufficiently, but you have to, here's a major research project is to ask, uh, how can we deal with the class of cases that uh, uh, Boscovich left uh, unexplained in his uh, bringing together the two kinds of mysteries? They're, they're still there. So here's a first step in how to capture it, but more has to be said. Well, the next uh, question is, what is L? What do you link things to? So let's take the simplest case, say, uh, noun phrase and verb phrase coordination. You know, John, Bill, Tom, the young man, et cetera, et cetera, uh, read the book, uh, walked to the store, so on and so forth. Uh, what's the linking in those cases? Well, the assumption that comes to mind right away is that, say, and incidentally, I should say that uh, I'm going to assume here that, no, that nominal phrases are actually NPs. Uh, the DP hypothesis, which is widely accepted, was very fruitful, led to a lot of interesting work, but I've never really been convinced of it. I think these things are fundamentally nominal phrases. Actually, it's a very good paper by Masa Oishi, who's here, who kind of spells out how this could work. Uh, this would mean that, say, in a nominal phrase, uh, things like uh, definite articles are actually... Uh, features of the nominal phrase. They're not elements merged into it, uh, very much like Semitic, where it's just a feature of the nominal phrase and, it, and the definite article appears in every element of the nominal phrase, including the determiner. Uh, that seems to me probably the way it works. Uh, as far as uh, determiners are concerned, like say that, I suspect they're adjuncts. Uh, so um, I'll be assuming that the core system is basically nominal. As I say, Massa's paper spells a lot of this out. Uh, that's, uh, so one suggestion you might have is that L is just N. Uh, but uh, that runs into an immediate uh, question. If you accept, the, oh, which I am accepting here, the uh, uh, Hagit Barrer, Alec Morant's uh, theory of uh, a root uh, categorization, which I think is pretty strongly motivated. Uh, you have uh, the roots in the lexicon are uh, independent of category. Uh, they become nominal or verbal, adjectival, uh, uh, by virtue of a categorizer that attaches to them. And incidentally, that would uh, surely be pair merged. So pair merges to them, and it's probably the, it has to be the first operation in forming a, forming a, a derivation. You sort of first attach the root to the category, the category to the root, and you sort of go on from there with a pair merged element. Uh, but uh, that uh, element, say n for 
a root that's going to become nominal that can't be identified with the n that is the link here, because this one, there, this one is just much higher up in the uh, in, in the uh, uh, syntactic object that you're constructing. Same with verb. It means that the small v, which is the categorizer, which uh, is linked to the root by uh, by uh, pair merge, can't be the same as what we call small v or small v star high up in the derivation. And in fact, I think that things like v and v star have been somewhat misinterpreted. Uh, they're not really the, it's not really a verbal categorizer. It's basically a phase marker. And uh, I think we should think of both n, what we've been calling, or what I'm now calling small n and small, we used to call small v, as being basically the two kinds of phase markers. Uh, the uh, And uh, uh, I think a kind of natural way of capturing this is to go back to a classical uh, distinction, actually goes back to classical Greece, which has been used sometimes in generative grammar, and to assume that we really have two fundamental notions, uh, classical terms, they're the notions substantive and predicative. Uh, which gives you uh, four categories, plus, s, minus, t, which is nominal, uh, minus, s, plus, t, which is verbal. And in uh, classical grammars, that's all there is. So if you look at the classical Greek grammars up till late into the Latin, the Roman period, uh, those are the only categories. There's no adjectives. Uh, adjective we can add, but we'll consider it a non-primitive category. It would be both substantive and predicative. And then there's, of course, the fourth one, which is neither. And that's... Uh, the rest of the junk that's lying around, prepositions and so on and so forth. Uh, but the two major categories, the ones that really count, are probably uh, uh, the ones that are the perfect substantive and the perfect predicate, the ones from essentially classical grammar. And uh, there is some, uh, and these are distinct from the categorizers, N and V, those are totally different notions. And these things then would mark the phases. And it's uh, kind of striking that, and they would be the links. Uh, all of these would be the things that coordination, uh, conjunction, disjunction link to. Uh, the, uh, uh, notice that uh, there's a well-known phenomenon about uh, extraction that uh, holds of both nominal phrases and verbal phrases. There are some nominal and verbal phrases which resist extraction. You can only extract to the edge. You can't go out of the element. So we'll call those strong. Uh, in the case of verb phrases, it's the transitive verb phrases, the ones that usually mark V star. Those constitute strong phases that you can't move out of. You've got to first go to the edge, then you can go on. Uh, the weak phases, uh, say, uh, unaccusatives, uh, passives, you can extract all the way. And there's the same distinction in nominal phrases. So the complex noun phrase constraint, uh, it's been known for a long time, it works strongly for definites, but not for indefinites. Uh, it's nonspecific and specific. So extraction out of a, a definite noun phrase is violates the rules, extraction out of an indefinite, nonspecific one is pretty straightforward. So it looks like both the nominal and verbal phases uh, have uh, um, the category, break into the category, say, strong and weak. Um, and uh, what we're calling V and little, the two types of flavors of V, V and V star, are probably just 
strong and weak uh, phase markers, perhaps uh, framed in this uh, in this uh, system. Uh, the uh, 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 the there is uh, another. Uh, th there's been a lot of discussion over the years about whether noun phrases are really phases like verb phrases. And uh, one problem about it was that they have a lot of similarities, but there's one notable difference. And that is you don't have an escape hatch in noun phrases. There's no nothing that allows you to go to the edge and then go on. But uh, fortunately, as I learned a couple of weeks ago, there's a nice African language called Bully, uh, which has, uh, which does have an escape hatch, uh, has a marker that says, okay, if this is here, we can add on to the noun phrase and then go on. So if we simply assume that the basis for all languages is uh, Semitic, Proto-Semitic, and Bully, then everything <laughs> works out. So we're off and running, just have to find the right languages. Other languages, like say English, are defective in this respect. They don't have that extra morphological element. Uh, it's one of the nice things about doing comparative work. You can fill in the blanks that ought to be there. Uh, well, if you uh, play with this, you'll notice that it, it can get pretty complicated. So for example, it could be that one of the conjuncts say um, S0, um, you know, S, you know, the third element in the sequence. It could, if this is a conjunction, uh, the third one could be a disjunction. Okay, you can stick a disjunction inside a conjunction. And that disjunction could be an unbounded, unstructured uh, element. And if you play with it, it gets very complex. I'll put that aside. The, the principles for dealing it are straightforward, but the actual working it out becomes pretty hairy. Uh, but it's not a fundamental problem, just a technical problem. Now, there is a fundamental problem, which was uh, uh, made very clear by uh, recent work of Barry Shines. I don't know if he's around here somewhere. But Barry has a very a terrific book, a great book that every semanticist ought to study carefully, which uh, I think is the longest book with the shortest title in the entire literature. It's the book called And, 600 pages of details about the extreme intriguing complexities that you get in the semantic interpretation of uh, coordinate structures. It's all done in a kind of an event calculus, neo Davidsonian event calculus. So here's the task. The task is to take Assuming that this is the right kind of syntactic formalism, you might play around with it a little. Assume that uh, if this is correct, how can you go to the, from this to those semantic objects? Okay, uh, I'll come back later if there's a little time to the nature of these uh, semantic objects, but uh, the, I, I think he gives good evidence that that's the kind of target that the mapping from syntax to formal semantics is trying to achieve. So here's a huge unsolved problem for those of you who are looking for um, dissertation topics, one of many. And I, fortunately, there's uh, lots of such topics hanging around. I should say, incidentally, that this is a dramatic difference from, uh, say, the 1950s and even the 1960s. At that time, it looked like there was almost no topics. It looked like the whole field was finished. I think I mentioned this earlier. And one of the really striking things that's happened during my lifetime is uh, that the field went from one that was terminated to one that's entirely endless and open. Uh, everywhere you look, there's just more problems. Now, that's a good sign that at least something's on the right track, because that's the way things ought to be. You know. People who are just coming into the field now probably aren't uh, struck by the dramatic difference. But if you look back, it really is dramatic. Uh, <clears throat> well, the, um, 
Uh, another case that's uh, an intriguing one is, uh, uh, let's see how to bring this in. Well, that's probably too complicated to go into. I'll skip this. Um, well, there are lots of other, uh, there are plenty of other candidates for pair merge. Uh, some of them are interesting unsolved problems. So for example, if you take uh, the paradigm, uh, things like uh, uh, John, uh, Mary saw the man walking down the street, say, or Mary saw the man walk down the street, uh, run through that familiar paradigm, uh, you notice that there's a, a gap, a strange gap in it. With the bear verbs, like Mary saw the man walk down the street, you can't passivize. So you can say, uh, the man was seen walking down the street, but not the man was seen walked down the street. Uh, this holds for two categories of verbs, uh, perception verbs and quasi-causative verbs, like uh, make or let. You know, so I made the guy walk down the street, but not the guy was made walk down the street. Uh, those two categories. Uh, this has been a kind of a funny sort of a gap for a long time, no good explanation for it. There is a proposal, an interesting proposal by Norvin Richards in terms of his contiguity theory, that it has to do with uh, the output of passivization. But that doesn't work because the same problem arises uh, with uh, in situ passives. So kind of a little awkward in English, normal in most languages, but uh, not bad in English. If you saw, say things like uh, uh, there were seen walking down the street to three men, let's say. Uh, that's more or less okay, but if you try, there were seen walk down the street three men, that's hopeless, okay. So there's a sharp distinction between uh, passives and non-passives, whether or not you move the object, okay. So that can't be what's involved. So what could be involved? Well, what could be involved is kind of suggested by the fact that this holds for the quasi-causatives, let and make. Uh, one might imagine, maybe, that these things really are just spelling, English-style spelling out of causative morphemes, uh, which attach to a, to a verb, which are all over the place. English tends to not use affixes to spell things out as words, but these things could be affixes. So it could be that let and make are just the causative affixes attached to the ver bare verb. Then comes an interesting question, why should perception verbs have the same property? But putting that on the shelf, if they all have this property, uh, what you might expect is that all of these are pair merged to the bare verb. And the pair merged element is just immune to the passive operation say, whatever you think passive is, maybe dropping uh, case, case, let's say. Uh, so that's, uh, that would fill in the gap, making use of the pair merge device. Uh, there are other uh, interesting proposals. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, Hisa Kitahara's suggestion about what has always been a pretty serious problem, uh, head raising. Head raising has none of the right properties. Uh, it uh, violates the extension condition. It, uh, it's always described incorrectly. Um, if uh, a verb raises to inflection, say to T, it's always described as if it's a T, but it's not, it's a V. Uh, the thing somehow that's adjoined is really verbal, not inflectional. And the verbal further move of V to C is really kind of a V-second phenomenon, not a T-second phenomenon. So there's all kind of problems. Another kind of problem with it is uh, it's sort of head raising has properties that are kind of shared, uh, that cross uh, syntax and phonology. So it's almost entirely like phonological processes in that it doesn't have semantic consequences. 
So whether you raise, uh, say, uh, take Jean-Yves Pollock's uh, analysis of French and English, uh, which many of you know, if you raise in French, you tend to raise the verb, in English not to raise it, but the semantics doesn't change. Uh, if you have a V-second language, it has the same semantic properties as a non-V-second language. And in fact, you have to look very hard, way out at the fringes, to find some kind of semantic uh, consequences to head raising. That makes it look phonological, uh, but the trouble is it's successive cyclic, which makes it look uh, syntactic. So it's kind of problematic all along. But the real question is how do you get around this? How can you actually create it without violating all the rules? Well, Hisa's proposal is this. Essentially, we'll just take the uh, uh, the T, T to C case, but the same for the others. Uh, you generate uh, and then VT. Uh, you generate C, uh, then that's just ordinary. Uh, it's not even generate. C is in the workspace, because that's where the lexicon is. So you just look at it. It's there in the workspace. Then you merge these two, pair merge them, uh, C, T. We now have a set the workspace now contains this and this. Notice by merging C and T, you haven't increased the number of accessible elements because neither of these is accessible. Okay, that was, as we've already pointed out, the, just like old man, neither is accessible. So, uh, and once you've done this, you now simply uh, merge this thing to that. That gives you the right answer. Uh, and if you think about it, you can do all the uh, head raising that way. Uh, I thought for a while that there were some problems about this. He said and I had corresponded about it, but I think the problems are easily overcome. Uh, so that's a uh, possible uh, way of approaching the entire problem of head, of, uh, uh, head raising, which has been a tricky and serious problem. So I'll leave it in your, your hands to play around with that and see if you can handle the rest of uh, head raising that way. But it's a simple way to proceed, which doesn't violate any of the rules, doesn't add accessible elements, just follows all. It's just available. You don't have to invent anything new for it. And it's crucially has to be pair merge, for one thing, because that's the way these things end up. They end up as adjuncts, not as sets. And secondly, it doesn't add accessible items, so it doesn't violate the resource constraint. So it has the right properties in that respect. Well, uh, there's, um, uh, there's plenty of questions like this. There's, um, uh, there's a, a lot of, the, the, a major task that is faced is to take all of the cases that, uh, two, two tasks, a narrow, uh, first one, take the cases that have been described usefully by illegitimate operations. So take all the cases that have been handled by, uh, say, late merge, which is very widely used, uh, or by uh, parallel merge, which gives you all the multidimensionality cases and so on. Now take that whole class of cases and show how you can handle them uh, by uh, legitimate operations. I gave a couple of examples last time, like ATB, uh, parasitic gaps, uh, but do it for the whole slew of them. And of course, the broader task is uh, take a look at that mass of uh, data out there and see if you can make some sense out of it. That's, uh, uh, we, ha we now have a criterion for what make sense means. Make sense means get a genuine explanation where a genuine explanation means one that's, uh, that, that can be, uh, that meets the conditions, the crucial conditions of learnability and uh, evolvability. And if you can reduce it to merge, 
you've solved that problem because there's no question of learnability and the problem of evolvability, as I mentioned, is basically solved. You have to look at the details of how it worked, but we know it happened, okay? So if you can get to that, you have a genuine explanation. If you can reduce things to pair merge, you've come pretty close. You still have to ask the question of how pair merge could have evolved. But at least that's an easier question than uh, lots of other things you can imagine. Uh, we would then like to try to show that the other devices that seem critical for explaining things, like, say, phase theory, uh, can be reduced to uh, third factor properties of uh, minimal computation. Uh, they do, in fact, reduce computation. So if you could show that that's uh, another third factor condition, like resource restriction, you'll have a genuine explanation. Now, that's the general project. But notice that, and make, it's again clear, should be clearer, going back to my first lecture, that this project only arises if you accept a particular version of what the whole enterprise of linguistics is. Uh, if you pick a particular kind of answer to the initial question, what's, what is language, what are we doing? Uh, the answer is, uh, the, the enterprise is one that attempts to deal with, to address uh, what I called earlier the Galilean challenge, the challenge that was posed at the beginning of the scientific revolution, uh, which translates in our terms into capturing the basic property of language, the property of that each of the faculty of language permits the generation of an infinite number of structured expressions with semantic interpretations and the option of ancillary operation of mapping it to one or another sensory motor condition. If you accept that project and then a particular variant of that project, which not all people who do generative grammar accept, uh, the second variant is to assume that this is part of natural science. Okay. In other words, follow what's called the biolinguistic program. Uh, take this property to be a property of human beings, not some object out in the external world, which somehow magically human beings connect with, but uh, just an actual property of human beings. Then you, meet, you have to meet the conditions of evolvability and learnability. Then we have the notion of genuine explanation then all this mass of questions arises, uh, often with solutions, uh, often not. Uh, notice again that not accepting this enterprise is perfectly legitimate. It's a way of getting, uh, describing things in ways which might be very useful. Uh, it's also uh, useful for engineering projects, uh, kind of Silicon Valley linguistics. We don't really try to explain it, just get something that works, uh, lots of interesting things you can do. But this is a very specific approach to language, saying it's part of natural science, it's trying to meet the Galilean challenge. If that's the enterprise, then these are the kind of questions that arise. Well, uh, there's another topic that I ought to at least mention, there's not much time for it, which is just left out entirely. Uh, a computational system has rules and uh, atoms, things that are you know, the smallest elements of the computation. I mentioned earlier that if you have, a, uh, if you have merge and a one element lexicon, you know, just one thing in the lexicon, one atom, then in fact uh, internal merge gives you the successor function. And I showed some reasons to think that that's a natural outcome. Uh, but in any event, there've got to be atoms. And I haven't said anything about those. So what are the atoms of computation? And uh, right at this point, we're moving to a domain that I really didn't talk about, uh, namely the general domain of semantics. So what's, how does the domain of semantics fit into this enterprise? Well, here you have to be a little careful. Uh, you have to ask what you mean by semantics. Uh, there's a classical notion, actually 
goes way back in history, but in the modern period, it's uh, Frege, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, uh, Tarski, Carnap, Quine, you know, that tradition. Uh, this concept of semantics has basically two, two essential notions. Uh, one is uh, One is the notion truth and reference, which are essentially the same thing. And the other is uh, the notion entailment, with many variants. Uh, so let's take a look at those two notions. Uh, first of all, the notion entailment is not semantics, it's syntax, okay? Uh, it's called logical syntax. Entailment is a matter of the formal relations among expressions. Uh, the world doesn't even have to exist, okay? Uh, semantics is the field that tries to relate the internal mental computations to the world, the actual real world out there. That's semantics. That's truth and reference. But entailment is logical syntax. and. Uh, if you look at what's called formal semantics, which is some of the richest and most exciting work going on in the field in the last uh, couple of decades, notice it's all syntax. It's all pure syntax. Uh, and it's an interesting kind of syntax. It's sort of analogous to uh, phonology. If you think about the externalization process, uh, what do we have? The syntax generates a set of objects, we then want to externalize it. And that process of externalization has two steps. The first, it's called, you know, traditionally uh, morphophonemics or phonology in the sense that, uh, say, Morris and Halley, Morris Halley and I use the term, but it's the mapping of the syntactic structures to some sort of phonetic form. The phonetic form is a syntactic object, of course, and the mapping is a, it's a symbolic manipulation. So it's, again, syntax in the general sense. It's a particular part of syntax. I should say that this task of uh, mapping, uh, what, what generative phonology, mapping syntactic structures to phonetic form, has pretty much been abandoned in modern phonology. Uh, contemporary phonology is mostly optimality theory, and that uh, simply doesn't look at this question, okay? It deals with other questions. Uh, but this question of generative phonology, which was in fact the first thing that was discussed back in the late 40s, early 50s, has been pretty much forgotten. But it's, it's there, you know, it's a problem that has to be solved if you uh, uh, are concerned with uh, uh, externalization with how language, you know, gets out there to be sounds or signs. Uh, the uh, so one t one task, which is really part of syntax, is uh, generative phonology, mapping syntactic objects to say narrow phonetics. Then there's another task, and that is taking the narrow phonetics and telling us uh, how it relates to uh, motions of the articulators or to sound waves or um, if, if you happen to be doing sign, how your gestures uh, end up uh, you know, actually being formed. You know, how do you move your fingers and so on. Uh, that's phonetics, acoustic and articulatory phonetics. Uh, if you think, go back to semantics, formal semantics is like phonology. It's uh, syntactic operations setting the stage, you hope, for eventual uh, relation to the outside world. Uh, just as phonology, generative phonology is syntactic operations setting the stage for the phonetician to fill in uh, how it relates to uh, moving your articulators around, okay, which gets you to the outside world, something outside language. Uh, well, this uh, then comes the question, um, notice that of all of the domains of the study of language, uh, it's almost all syntax. It's uh, 
what we call kind of narrow syntax, just forming the syntactic objects, what I've been talking about the last couple of days. Another part of syntax is generative phonology. Another part of syntax is formal semantics. Uh, all of this stuff is going on inside the head, right? Doesn't get to the outside world. Uh, it's neither phonetics nor semantics. Uh, the, of all of these areas, uh, the, the area of formal semantics is different from the other two in the way it's been pursued, which raises interesting questions. Uh, it is the only domain that has not been subjected to the effort to find genuine explanations. So there's no effort within formal semantics to ask what's the simplest way to do it. Now, the problem is let's just find a way to do it. You know, If you can get a way to do it by sticking in lots of lambdas and so on and so forth, OK, we'll do it that way. Uh, but the question of what's the best way to do it, the way that really gives explanations, that really hasn't been raised. Now, that's not a criticism. It's a very hard question. And so if it's not been raised, well, hard questions often tend not to be raised. But uh, one should remember that it's a question to be dealt with someday. Uh, as formal semantics develops, this branch of syntax develops, it should go the way of uh, generative syntax and generative phonology. In the case of generative phonology, there's a lot of work on how to get the optimal way of doing it. In fact, that's what things like sound pattern of English are about and many other, plenty of other work. And, and narrow syntax is kind of stuff we've been talking about. Uh, formal semantics, that part of syntax, the question really hasn't arisen. Uh, sooner or later, it should arise. Uh, another uh, interesting aspect of formal semantics is it's, uh, it's kind of tacitly assumed to be invariant. So if you, uh, th there's no proposals that uh, languages have parametric differences in how you interpret, say, quantifiers and variables. There's a way of doing it, and if you do it, that's universal, which is a very reasonable assumption. Because if you think about the things that are being investigated, there's absolutely no empirical evidence for them. A child has no evidence about any of them. Uh, so if you look at the literature and you look at the things that are people are studying, they're totally without evidence. So either they're just not accurate, or if they're accurate, they're going to be universal. So it does make sense to say that this part of syntax is invariant. I've talked a little about whether narrow syntax is invariant. That's an open question. It doesn't look like it on the surface, but a lot of the work that's been done is kind of restricting the domain of variability of narrow syntax to the point where you might imagine that the core of narrow syntax, what's dealing with the Galilean challenge, uh, the um, yield the struct the operations that are yielding the semantically interpreted objects maybe that doesn't vary that we don't know it's an open question could uh, if it doesn't vary at all then the variability of language is entirely an externalization where it certainly varies all over the map no not any question there i mean not you know it's not free there's very interesting restrictions but a lot of variation possible so that's the kind of picture that seems to be emerging, I think. Uh, and it leaves open this thing here. Where does that fit in? Uh, how do we relate this stuff that's going on inside the head uh, to the outside world? Uh, turns out not to be such a simple question. Uh, the, uh, uh, in fact, uh, if you look at the proposals in formal semantics, uh, we, they sound as if they're relating to the outside world. But when you look at them, they're actually not. So take, say, model theoretic approaches. Uh, the elements of the model are sort of, one treats them as if they're actually out there. But in fact, if you look at the elements of the model, they're completely mental objects. 
there's nothing in the outside world that is, corresponds to those postulated objects of the model. So the model theoretic semantics works fine. You know, you can do all kinds of things with it, study uh, necessity, you know, um, so on and so forth, uh, but it's all pure syntax. It's not getting to the outside world. Uh, what about event semantics, which is a very rich and productive field, uh, the kind of neo-Davidsonian event semantics? Uh, well, what are events? I mean, are events things in the world? Does the world come packaged in events? Uh, actually, it doesn't. You know, events are our mental constructions imposed on whatever's going on. Uh, so events are really internal. And uh, we know that uh, to try to count the number of events that's going on is kind of meaningless. So for example, thanks to uh, Zeno, we know that if you walk across the room, there's a continuous, uh, the number of events is the power of the continuum. Okay, and same with anything else you're looking at. So there are about as many events as you decide to impose. So event semantics, which is very productive and rich, is in, again another form of syntax. Uh, so how do we get beyond syntax? Uh, well, we have to look at the notion of reference. Truth will depend on reference. And if we want to look at the notion of reference, uh, we start naturally by looking at the words uh, that purport to refer. So you look at the literature on reference, uh, mostly philosophical literature, and say London is taken to be a prototypical a referential word. Uh, a lot of problems arise, uh, say Kripke's Puzzles of Belief, when you try to ask uh, questions about London. But is London a thing in the outside world? Uh, well, you can ask yourself. So for example, uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, I visited London uh, before it was burned down and rebuilt uh, 20 miles up the Thames. So is there an object in the real world which is physical, because it can be burned down, uh, but then can be rebuilt somewhere else uh, with different physical objects and looking differently. Is there such an object in the physical world, in the outside, in the material world? Certainly not. Uh, I could, we could decide to uh, rebuild Carthage, let's say. It was gone a couple thousand years ago. We could rebuild it somewhere else, uh, look different, but it could be Carthage. Uh, so whatever these things are, they're not names of things in the outside world. Uh, what about other words? Are there, in fact, we might rest the question whether there are any words in language at all that refer to anything in the outside world. I think the answer is there aren't. Uh, some of the reasons for this were given as far back as classical Greece. So for example, Aristotle uh, uh, asked the question, uh, what is a house? And his answer was, uh, a house consists of uh, the uh, amalgam of two different kinds of elements. In his metaphysics, they're matter and form. So the matter of the house is uh, the timbers, the bricks, uh, you know, the stuff it was made of. Uh, the form of the house is the design, uh, what it's for, uh, what the architect had in mind, how it's used, and so on. So something might look physically just like a house, but in fact be something totally different. It could be a library, let's say. It could be a garage, you know. Could be a paperweight for a giant. Could be all <laughs> kinds of things. It depends on what the architect had in mind and how it's used and uh, what it's for, basically. But the properties of form are not in the physical world. They're in the mental world. Uh, now, I, um, when our Aristotle talked about this, uh, this is, from his point of view, metaphysics. In fact, it's in his book, Metaphysics. But when you go to the 17th century again, there was a kind of a cognitive revolution. 
And a lot of these ideas were reinterpreted in terms of modes of cognition, which I think is the right way to look at them. So reinterpreting it in that, those terms, a house is something that we construct in our minds, which has a material element, but of course the crucial part of it is what Aristotle called the form. That's something that's part of our mental operations. So when we use the word house, we're not referring to an object. And we are, in fact, we're carrying out the act of referring, like I'm referring to that object over there, but the word house is not referring, okay? You think about every word in the language, it's exactly the same way. Uh, there's an example even earlier than uh, Aristotle, the uh, uh, pre-Socratic uh, example used by uh, Heraclitus, who argued that you can't cross the same river twice uh, because when you cross it the second time, it's a completely different physical object and you're a different physical object. So it's impossible to cross the same river twice. Of course, we do cross the same river twice, uh, which simply tells us that our notion river does not refer to anything in the material world. It refers to a construction that we developed. And if you start playing around with how do you individuate these objects, it becomes pretty tricky. Uh, so for example, take river uh, again, uh, say the, uh, you know, the Charles River, which I used to cross on the way to work up and back every day in Boston. Uh, suppose you take the Charles River and uh, you reverse the course of the water. It goes the opposite direction. Okay, you've still the Charles River. Uh, suppose you divert it into a different uh, direction because you don't want it to go into the bay but somewhere else, uh, still the Charles River. Uh, in fact, uh, you can play around with it and make all sorts of massive changes in the physical object and it'll still be the Charles River. On the other hand, there are trivial changes that will prevent it from being a river at all. Uh, so suppose you put uh, barriers along the side and you start using it for, say, commercial tankers going up and down. Uh, now it's between two points, then it's a canal. It's not a river anymore. Uh, suppose you even make a more minuscule change. You make what in physics is called a phase change from the uh, liquid to the glassy state. Tiny change, almost undetectable without instruments. But now it has a hard surface. And you paint a line down the middle and you start using it to commute to Boston. Okay, now it's a highway. Uh, you've made an almost undetectable change. If you play around with it some more, you can see that you can make huge changes in the physical object that stays the Charles River. You can make virtually undetectable changes. It's not a river at all. Uh, take a look at any other word in the language you find it's pretty much the same. So it may be that language simply does not have the concept of truth and reference at all, which means it doesn't have semantics. There is no semantics. There's syntax and there's modes of use it using the objects you've constructed, roughly what's called pragmatics. It could turn out that the whole study of language reduces to syntax and pragmatics, with syntax having these many different variants. Uh, in fact, uh, my guess is uh, that's probably what we're uh, going to find when we, uh, uh, when we pursue the topic further. Uh, that raises many very interesting questions. So for example, take these terms like house or river, uh, London, uh, whatever you like. Uh, where do they come from? If we look at animal symbolic systems, a very striking feature of them is that the atoms of these systems, the elements within them, do in fact uh, pick out identifiable physical events, okay? So you take the, uh, um, take the bee that has my name attached to it. If it's a honey bee and does the right sorts of things, then it's, uh, you know, it does the famous waggle dance, it 
flies out to a flower, comes back uh, to the hive, you know, waggles, and the things that it's doing are one-to-one -one identified with particular physical phenomena extraneous to the bee. The distance to the flower, the height of the flower, the orientation in which you have to fly, you know, the quality of the flower, and so on. Uh, every animal system we know is like that. Uh, monkey calls, for example, uh, if there's something we call a warning call, what it means is uh, the leaves are fluttering in a certain way, the monkey reflexively emits some noise, uh, other monkeys run away, uh, maybe an eagle's coming, something like that. Uh, animal systems seem to be like this completely. The human systems are not like this at all. That raises a very interesting question, uh, another one of those mysteries. Where did this come from? And if you look at the uh, array of uh, mysterious things, there are plenty of them, and they fall into a couple of categories, two categories. Uh, one category is the category of mysteries where we just can't get the right kind of evidence because it's just empirically impossible for us to do it. Um, we can't go back uh, say, 200,000 years and hear what people were saying. You know. In principle, yeah, it's, it's an empirically possible, it's a theoretically possible task, but you just can't do it. That's one kind of mystery. But then there's the deeper kinds of mysteries, which uh, have to do with things like uh, selecting the uh, sequence given by the uh, Hilbert epsilon operator when you're trying to form a coordination, or more generally just picking what sentence you're going to produce. And uh, these kinds of mysteries are the kind where you really don't even have bad ideas. There's no idea as to how to proceed. Uh, those, we could ask uh, what that category of mysteries is like, could mean it's some restriction on uh, human cognitive capacities. Uh, a lot of debate about this. Uh, most uh, scientists uh, vigorously reject the idea that there could be a limit on cognitive capacities. Uh, but uh, if you think about it, it's a strange position. If uh, humans are similar or part of the organic world, not, say, angels, uh, we ought to have the same properties as other kinds of organisms in some respects. Every organism we know has scope of cognitive capacity and limits of cognitive capacity. And in fact, the two are kind of logically related. Whatever is yielding the scope is also imposing certain limits. And you might ask why humans should be exempt from this. Well, I'll leave that with you as another problem. <laughs> going to have a 